All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, to continue the logistics delivery discussion, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Captain Brian Engelman, uh, also from EWS, who's going to talk about uh, taking us out into space. Thank you, sir, uh, for the introduction again. I'm Captain Brian Engelman, I'm a logistics officer with EWS Conference Group 10. The topic I want to talk about, uh, we gave a fun name to ballistic logistics, but the, I guess, more uh common sense name was suborbital cargo transportation so what is is a solution to the sustainment of distributed forces in a contested environment i think trevor did a great job of defining the problem so i don't need to get into that as much as i plan to uh because it seems that it's a well-established problem that we have first start off with um in april of 1964 the marine corps gazette published a very short article about something called icarus which stood for Intercontinental Aerospace Craft Range Unlimited System. I really think they were just going for that acronym, obviously. But this was supposed to be the expeditionary force of the future. You had Marines and equipment loaded onto rockets, and they could be shot off from aircraft carriers or anywhere within the United States and land anywhere in the world, disembark with their jetpacks and their equipment, and they could take their fight to the enemy. Uh, that seems kind of like a crazy idea uh, for that time and for today. But... I would argue that as technology continues to progress, we are getting closer and closer, if not containing or obtaining the technology today to achieve such a capability. Graphically depicts the problem that we're looking at here. Uh, I've made this fun animation, so please bear with me. Theater distribution, you're going from CONUS on the left to the continent, wherever theater of operations is, or the uh, islands, whatever you've got. A need is identified, it's going to be sourced from a warehouse or supplier, it's loaded onto a truck, and it's brought to a seaport. And then it's put onto a ship and it goes across the ocean to another seaport. Or it's brought to an airport and it's put onto a plane and it's flown across. And uh, again, it's offloaded, uh, disembarked, and then either put onto further commercial transportation or transferred over to military uh, equipment transportation, and it's going to be completing that last tactical mile and delivery to the warfighter. The problem, as Trevor uh, kindly identified for me, was uh, what happens when it's a contested environment? What happens when the enemy has the capability to strike our logistics nodes uh, that are, I guess, vulnerable, something that we don't have as large a footprint and large of a defense, um, or if they choose, they, they can hit us all the way from when we enter the theater up until it's delivered to the warfighter. And then are we exposing the warfighter and making them more vulnerable because of our sustainment methods? So, again, summarizing the problem is the sustainment of those EABs and the standard forces and all the various concepts that have now developed as a result of Force Design 2030. With that, there's an understanding that there's going to need to be a greater reliance on local procurement methods. Uh, anything that we can buy off the local economy, uh, we should be buying off the local economy. However, that doesn't cover everything that we're going to need. And you can be in certain areas where it's just there's nothing available to purchase. Uh, another issue that you're going to run into is um, you're not going to be able to stockpile your supplies, your arms and ammunitions. We can do caches, kind of experimenting with that. But uh, any stockpile is going to have a footprint, it's going to have a signature, and it's going to become a high value target. So those will not be permitted within uh, a contested area. And then finally, our transportation methods are vulnerable. So seafaring and aviation transportation methods are our most common methods of logistical sustainment uh, that we have today. And based off of what we've seen, these things will not be capable of surviving within this distributed contested environment. Uh, during my research, found a study done by Naval Postgraduate School in 2020, where this group assessed the survivability of our current logistics seafaring vessels. And based off of the things, the platforms they looked at, which were current and forthcoming, like the light amphibious warship okay. and whatnot, they estimated from their simulations they'd be able to complete less than one round trip of logistical delivery uh, per craft. Wow. So that's with the assumption that if China wants to target us, that, that if they can detect us, they will target us. Um, that's a bold assumption, but we don't want to be at the mercy of our adversary to decide whether or not they want to waste a missile on our ships. Um, so 
make the assumption that if they can shoot us, they will shoot us. So the solution, as I propose, um, is the use of suborbital cargo rockets. Uh, they're survivable and they're expedient. Um, to get into suborbital, what that means, if anyone's familiar with the Mercury project, you have, I guess, two standout uh, astronauts, right? You have uh, Alan Shepard, it's first American into space. He went on a suborbital flight. He went up and he came back down. Then you have John Glenn, is the first Mar first American to orbit the Earth. I think he went up and orbited like three times or so, and then he came back down. So the difference is the amount of energy that the rocket has, and I guess its trajectory, whether or not it's going all the way into orbit. Things that are suborbital don't require the same amount of energy as things that are orbital. Okay. Um, but at the same time, suborbital things have the capability of going great distances over short periods of time. So talk about survivability. Uh, just by their very nature, suborbital rockets are challenging to interdict. Uh, they're similar to ballistic missiles, so a ballistic missile defense system would be the most appropriately matched defense system to target a uh, logistics payload, if you will. If we're putting this in the frame of China as a pacing threat, uh, their ballistic missile defense capabilities are questionable right now. On the unclass side, I couldn't find anything that definitively said they have ballistic missile defense systems. But it's well known that they have anti satellite weapons, and that is not a very different. Set of technology that's required okay. uh, for anti satellite, so it, it's not. It's, it's not hard to come to the conclusion that they probably have ballistic missile defense, but with that, you would assess that it's probably a strategic it's strategic in nature. And it's something that if they knew what it was, they were shooting at, would they really shoot at a logistics uh, payload? And hopefully they wouldn't be able to detect the logistics payload, but that's not here or there right now. Um, next best thing to target this method would be advanced air defense systems. So talking about your S-400 family, things that China is known to be procuring right now. Okay. Uh, the issue with that is what it's designed to target. So advanced air defense systems are designed to target low observable aircraft and precision guided munitions, and these are going from horizon to horizon, uh, parallel to the earth, whereas the suborbital trajectories are gonna be coming from high to low. They're gonna be coming at a much steeper angle, something that advanced air defense systems aren't designed to target. Uh, so really you're looking at the terminal phases of flight of a suborbital payload is when it would be vulnerable to something like this. But then you run into the issue of it's a couple million dollars per missile for these air defense systems. So again, is it worth it for them to employ this against a logistics payload? Uh, and we have yet to see whether or not they'd make that decision. Next thing is expediency. I talked about uh, just to quickly summarize this to reach halfway around the world, which is about 12,000 miles. Uh, a suborbital rocket that's capable of getting to the other side of the earth. It's going to approach speeds of close to 15,000 miles an hour, and it's going to have a flight duration of about 42 minutes. Wow. Granted, we can't have our payload crash into the Earth at a couple thousand miles an hour, so it's going to have to slow down, and that's going to add to your flight duration a little bit. But you can comfortably say that from launch to landing, your payload is getting there within an hour. We don't need to get to the other side of the Earth. I think from here to the other side of the Earth is uh, somewhere off the west coast of Australia. Uh, we're not trying to say anything there. We actually can go shorter distances. So to say, if we're sending something to Luzon in the Philippines, we're launching from Quantico, it's about 8,500 miles. So that's a good bit less than 12,000 miles. If you're shooting from Nellis Air Force Base by Vegas, 7,300 miles. If you're shooting from Hawaii, just over 5,000 miles. So as you get closer and closer, that flight duration reduces. So it gets there even quicker and then the infrastructure and the capability of the launch vehicle goes down. So it's not as robust, it doesn't need to be as large and it can carry larger payload, shorter distances. So here's another animation. Uh, this is the concept simplified here. So on the left there, you've got the continental United States, you've got a great ocean in the middle and then you've got your advanced base over there with your high Mars battery. Uh, those tubes are empty. They've fire their rockets and uh, they need resupply. That requirement has been identified. It's gonna be sourced from CONUS. 
can be launched from sites across the continental United States because of that capability to go far distances. So because there'd be multiple sites across the United States, it would shorten that link in the chain as far as how long it takes to get them that supply. Uh, rocket goes up, utilizing reusable rockets, um, possibly the first stage can return um, and be reused. That's gonna drive down launch vehicle costs. So you're not building a new rocket every single time you're standing up a payload. And then the payload is going to continue on a suborbital trajectory. And then as it re-enters the atmosphere, maybe we'll have some control surfaces that are going to direct it to its drop zone. And then as it gets into terminal descent, it's going to have parachutes that can guide it uh, with fairly accurate precision to the DZ where standing forces are awaiting the cargo and can be retrieved, loaded up into their high bars, and they can continue uh, continue their miss mission there. Right. So the first thing that comes to mind when talking about this is economic feasibility. Like rockets, rockets are expensive. Yeah. Um, kind of show where we're going with rockets in the modern ages. In 2011, we had the last flight of the space shuttle. It's costing around almost $62,000 per kilogram of payload. Okay. Uh, that's quite expensive and cost prohibitive. In 2018, SpaceX launched their Falcon Heavy, which is to date the most cost effective way to put something into low Earth orbit. Um, it costs around $1,400 uh, per kilogram of payload. So you see that drastic decrease in cost of flight, cost of putting cargo into low Earth orbit. And again, we specified that we're not trying to put stuff into orbit. We're just trying to lob it to get it somewhere on the other side of the Earth. SpaceX, as well as other things like uh, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, those are your celebrity space-faring rocket companies right now that everyone kind of knows about and sees in the news. But what you don't see is that there's over 5,000 companies, private companies, commercial companies within the U.S. that are space-focused, whether it's satellites or launch vehicles. Uh, that was as of 2021. So there's a growing industry within the United States alone, as far as developing launch vehicles, because in the commercial sector, if you can develop reusable and cost-effective methods of putting things up into space, you can expend or extend your uh, market to more people who normally wouldn't be able to afford to put something into space. Right. And then you can have more customers, you can bring in larger income. So you have more customers, but you're charging them less rather than having just a few customers that you have to charge a whole lot. So costs are probably gonna continue to decrease. And yes, sir. That That is, are the, the expectation of what we're doing. And you see with SpaceX, they have their Starship system where their aim is to make this thing completely reusable. So it's similar to an aircraft where it can land, okay. get some basic checks and inspections, be refueled and just launched again. Um, and there, there's aspiration is to have a flight within the same day with this rocket system. Uh, and it's something that our joint force is interested in. The Air Force especially, the Air Force Research, Research Laboratory said that uh, they made rocket cargo, one of their Vanguard programs for research. Uh, they're looking at something that would be employed similar to a, a C-17, where you could load it up with cargo, looking around 100 short tons of cargo. Uh, this thing launched uh, anywhere on the Earth. It lands. It can be serviced, refueled, and launched back. I would argue that's not the need the Marine Corps needs, or in this uh in this sort of environment, this application I'm talking about, we would want something closer to aerial delivery capability. Um, but, and this capability of a rocket C-17, if you will, uh, we could benefit from it, but it, it's not something I, I think uh, we want to invest in heavily right now. We want to invest more in uh, that spendable capsule carrying a payload and with reusable first stage. Biggest takeaway with this, though, is it's a lease service is what they're talking about. So we're not going to have rocket mechanic MOSs. Uh, you're not going to have rocket squadrons. You're going to take the entire life cycle of the craft and you're going to keep it at the commercial, the, the vendor, whoever's providing this service. So similar to how we have Omni Air, we have Atlas, uh, you've got Delta, they carry our stuff, they carry our people, um, whether you're going to ITX or whether you're going to uh, Darwin, you can commercially contract this vehicle to provide this service, and that reduces the burden on us to maintain 
probably what is a very exquisite and expensive piece of equipment uh, to maintain the life cycle of. There are limitations that come with it. Um, that must be said, rockets are not the universal solution. So I'm not saying that we need to get rid of our aircraft. We need to get rid of our boats and ships and invest wholly in rocketry. Uh, rockets will never compete with cargo ships when it comes to economy of scale. Mm. Uh, right now, I don't think there is anything that exists that can compete with a large cargo ship as far as uh, fuel effectiveness and amount of cargo that can be transported. For this reason, there are probably classes of supply that you shouldn't be putting on a suborbital rocket. Uh, what comes to mind for me is your class one, so your water and your chow, and then your bulk fuels. The reason I say that is these are large in volume and they're heavy. Okay. So you're going to eat up a lot of that payload capacity uh, just by putting in a couple hundred gallons of fuel. And at the end of the day, is it really worth it to send a couple hundred gallons of fuel to someone on the other side of the earth if we can maybe continue to innovate in other realms to deliver the supplies via other methods? Um, and I think what Trevor was talking about is an outstanding example of this. This is something the rockets would be a good intertheater transportation okay. method for critical supplies that cannot be obtained lo locally or uh, we're not willing to risk, uh, I guess, due to their expense or due to the criticality. We, we just don't want to risk them being targeted uh, by the enemy. This is something that can get in there a lot quicker and get to the forces so they can use it and continue to continue with the fight. So, uh, ballistic logistics, we want to sustain the Marine Corps' fight in any climb and space. Excellent. Excellent. Well done. Well done. Um, okay, so the you talked a little bit about using them, especially the uh, the Air Force's version uh, as kind of an intermediary, and then um, potentially the the uh, ballistic logistics right directly to the EAB as a as a potential higher end menu option, right? So sure. as we get into competition or high end uh, high end competition rather into conflict, then this becomes one of those things on the menu of options to try and get resupply over there. I think yes, that sir. makes a lot of sense. Um, and then you combine that potentially, right? Uh, especially as the intermediate logistics with some of the uh, the, the glider technologies uh, to actually get it a little bit closer. I think that this is a great exploration, and it gets us, I think, one step closer to becoming space marines, which is something I've always been a fan of. Absolutely, sir. I'm I'm happy uh, that you are continuing this research and, and making it known to the rest of us. All right, uh, we'll open it up now to questions from the uh, the live or virtual audience. I see a couple here in the room. I do have a, a quick question for you. So, uh, you had mentioned the suborbital rockets uh, being able to be detected, uh, whether or not uh, the, the adversary can detect that that's a logistical payload or not. Do you think that by using suborbital rockets, that there's the, the possibility of triggering an intercontinental ballistic missile response just from, hey, the United States is launching something over towards us? Uh, I don't know. I don't know that it's logistics. I don't, I don't know. Uh, what do you think? So I think that would be certainly a concern uh, that would need to be thoroughly researched and identified. Um, there is across many nations, ballistic missiles uh, are employed or are designed to be employed with conventional warheads. So just because a con ballistic missile is launched, does nations cannot jump to the conclusion that it's a nuclear attack. Um, I think with the proliferation of ballistic missiles across the entire uh, globe um, and with the, I guess, the, the creation of other things like hypersonic glide vehicles, right, where if I want to really get you with a nuke, there's probably a better way than shooting a very high rocket that's going to go up that the possibility of it being detected by those ballistic missile defense radars um, it's much greater than a hypersonic glide vehicle where I could put my nuclear payload on that and I, I could get you before you knew what was coming. Um, I know we're maybe not at the capability we wanna be with that sort of system right now, but I agree, it is it is a, a danger. Um, it's something that as we develop this capability, maybe it's not something that we are keeping hush-hush. Um, Maybe it's something that we're widely showing, like, hey, we have this capability uh, so that our adversaries know, hey, this is a capability. 
Um, you run into vulnerabilities with, I guess, what you were talking about is uh, how closely can they track these things? Can they pinpoint where our forces are? Uh, that's something that we would need to look at. Uh, but if it's widely known that this is a capability that we'd be employing, um, I can't answer that question directly. I, I agree that is a potential. No, I think problem. that's good. Yeah, but but your point, I think there, it's, since there's so many more of them that are coming online and will continue to come online, it'll make it a little harder for them to figure out what's what's truly you know, like the potential nuclear option and what's all the other rockets that are going up and about. But uh, a, a very important concern that I'm sure will be uh, will be considered as these things are employed. Less of a question for nothing. Mentioned this the uh, accessible voting, I suppose I should say. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the possibility that adversaries might not shoot at logistics payloads because of ones that he's familiar One, like I said, this is less of a question than something I've observed. So I've been paying really close attention to what's been going on in Ukraine, and one of seems to be going on is that the Ukrainians have identified Russian fuel and supply specifically of fuel as a key mm. vulnerability because of all the problems they've been having. Obviously, we're not the Russian army, but in the event where there's a serious uh, supply shortage of one thing or another, uh, I would have I would submit that uh, the Chinese or any other peer-to-peer -peer adversary with capabilities would take shots at logistics. So, Deliveries, payloads, convoys. Mm -hmm. uh, if they identify that, like that's probably the thing that we know they need. If they don't have it, then they're you know, the Russian uh, fuel depots that are on fire right now. Mm -hmm. So it may make it, it up the uh, the adversaries targeting uh, prioritization. Yeah, like identify it, which makes sense. So you, yeah. Uh, uh, go ahead. Sure. I I completely agree. Um, I think it comes back to as far as what capability do they have to target it and if it's their ballistic missile defense where it is this highly strategic thing that they want to they probably don't have a huge inventory um of their ballistic missile defense rockets or missiles uh maybe they don't want to deplete their magazines for something that is not a potential nuclear weapon it may be a very special very limited scenario uh, and one of the things that i was thinking about as you were talking about the traditional logistics cycle which is very long and usually Classified, not very well protected. So it's the C2 of logistics is also a key vulnerability, right? That we've identified that we're trying to shore up. But shortening the delivery, right? Uh, shortening the C2 of that and the delivery, I think, is another potential benefit to that, right? So it helps it helps protect the uh, the command and control chain. All right, EWS, we'll give you another shot. No, no, uh, okay. And I think we're wrapping up on time, but uh, this video will be up and we'll obviously share contact information for all of our briefers. So if you have follow on, uh, and I hope that you do follow up on this as you had out, you said to 3 MF. Uh, yes, sir, 3rd MLG. 3rd MLG, so uh, hopefully you'll get to continue this uh, from the far end and help them work through this. Yes, sir. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate it, sir, thank you. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.